What's up, folks? Another exciting episode of the Butt and Brenneman Show. We're in the thick of football season right now. And what I'm excited to dive into with my guy Adam Brenneman here is a couple big time matchups within the conference, specifically what I would say, and I'd like to get your opinion on this, the best environment to play in in all of college football. Night game, whiteout, Penn State, that's the challenge for Iowa going on the road this weekend. In your experience, what is that like being the home team in that environment? It is an absolutely bonkers environment. And it's not just it's not just game day. It's it's all week, right? It's all week around Happy Valley. Whiteout week is is enormous. It's a whole it's like a holiday in, in State College. People flock to State College for the week. So there's Number one, there's a lot of distractions, distractions all over the place. Now you got NIL distractions. You got everyone hitting you up for tickets in the world. <laughs> you're trying to you're trying to get tickets for friends and family. Uh, and the whole time, you got to stay focused because it's a tough matchup. Um, you know, it, it's going to be Drew Aller's first real test against a really tough defense. Um, yeah. So th- th- there's a lot of distractions around Happy Valley. But even as the home team, you have to be prepared to play in that environment because it's going to be loud. It's going to be Penn, even Penn State will be silent cadence. They'll be they'll be all hand signals because you can't hear even when you're on offense in that environment. Even when you're the home team in that environment, so it's going to be an absolutely bonkers night. Uh, and and from what I heard, uh, from all the reports I've heard from State College, the people are already flocking there on Wednesday. The town's buzzing, so it's it's, it's going to be a fun one. The town is buzzing because the team's rolling too. And this is a big test, as you mentioned. You know, I always said with, with, uh, with road games, I mean, there's a certain level of noise where you just, it's really hard to hear anyways. And, it, you know, it, there's, a, there's a lot of stadiums you go on the road. Like, you're not necessarily going to hear the quarterback snap count. But Penn State's a, you can't hear a conversation with the person next to you. So, like you said, hey, you have to go to silent snap count. What does that mean? I mean, it is all hand signals, and everyone has to look at the ball of their peripheral vision. Like, you're using hand signals to communicate. It is it, That's a big-time challenge for teams on the road. You, you touch on one direction I want to go here with it being Drew Aller's first real, real test. I mean, Iowa, Iowa defense, and I saw your defensive coordinator rankings with Phil Parker, rightfully so, at number one. What... What are you looking for specifically for Drew Aller facing that Hawkeye defense this week? Yeah, I, I think Phil Parker, knowing his style and knowing how Iowa, Iowa wants to play, they're going to come into this game with the sole focus of shutting down Penn State's run game. They're going to sh- try to shut down Catron Allen and Nick Singleton, two of the best running backs in the country, and force Drew Aller to win this game with his arm. Uh, I, I think if I'm in that off- if I'm in that defensive staff meeting with Phil Parker. I'm saying we're not going to lose this game by letting Penn State run for 250 yards, right? If we're going to lose, it's because Drew Aller, the the young quarterback, beat us throwing the football. So they're going to load the box. One high safety, roll the second the second guy back down into the box, seven-man boxes. I mean, that, that's what they're going to do. And it's going to force Aller to, to make plays. And that means that a receiver like Keandre Lambert-Smith, I think he's the X factor in this game. The mm-hmm. receiver ring for Penn State has been a question mark all offseason. Keandre Lambert Smith played really well, p- played really well in week one. Uh, he's made some big plays. He's going to have one on one coverage. He's going to be one on one. He's going to have to win and be the guy that Drew Aller can go to. It's going to be exciting because because you know it's going to be a game that uh, that that Drew Aller is going to have to go win at some point and win with his arm. So I'm looking forward to seeing it. And, and I think everyone knows what's coming from Iowa, right? Stop the run. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I almost see it. I see exactly what you're saying, but I also see what Phil Parker does. And it's like, this has been the same defense that he has run for yep. his entire career. And the base structure of Iowa's defense is just quarters. It's cover four. It's quarters coverage. And you look at the film and it's like, this isn't really exotic. Like, it's not, you're not playing... You know, I, I don't know, some double A gap, exotic pressures, like rolling safeties. Like there's not a bunch of crazy looks. But the challenge in that is because it almost looks deceivingly like you can beat it because you, you what they line up in, you, you can effectively see it. And, and what Phil Parker does and where this specifically ap- applies to Drew Aller is for four quarters, he's basically saying, I dare you to be fundamentally sound and disciplined. Are you disciplined enough to take the check down when it's there? Are you disciplined enough to throw it away when it's too tight of coverage? Are you disciplined enough to take your shot if it is there, you know? 
But the moment you aren't disciplined enough, the moment yeah. you we'll test the secondary, and they don't, the, the thing about Iowa's defensive backs, they have the best hands of any secondary in the country. They don't just bat the ball away. Those dudes, if it's an, if it's an opportunity to intercept it, they're coming down with it. And that's been their MO to winning games for as long as time is defensive takeaways and the offense gets good field position. So that that's the defensive side of the ball. And, and you got and, what, and the not to cut you off, Jay, but that cover four you mentioned, which I think is important to we could talk ball about defenses all day. But that cover four they play, what's it really end up playing like? It ends up playing like zero. Right. Yeah. It ends up just playing looking like cover zero because the safeties come down in the box and now it's just one on one matchup. So that's yes. what they, that's what they do so well. It's it's the cover four, but it's not always the traditional cover four with the safeties at 13 yards and, and your corners playing. It, they'll press those guys and put them on put them on island. So that, that yeah. again, that, that that's the exciting part for Drew Aller. He's going to have some plays to be made on the field. This is good stuff because, OK, so you have cover two, like two high safeties are deep. You have cover three, three high. There's each cover. Cover four, but it's not four high. Like what you do with cover four is those two safeties are somewhere in between. They're sitting about 10 to 12 yards with their eyes in the backfield. And they're part of the run fits. Like if they read run, their their first step isn't back like cover two or cover three. Their first step is downhill to stop the run. So it's a great, great observation. Now on the flip side though, okay, so what needs to travel on the road, specifically in a in a whiteout at Penn State, is you need to play good defense. Okay, cool. So so Iowa will challenge Penn State's excellent offense. That's going to be a great matchup. But what I believe to be true is on the road at Penn State particularly, you need to be able to run the ball. You have to be able to run the ball and control the clock. So as you look at this with Manny Diaz defense, flying around, man, maybe the fastest defense in the Big Ten in my opinion. And you look at Iowa coming off one of their best statistically running games going back to 2019. What do you see, what are the keys to that matchup? Yeah, I think there's a bunch. I mean, the strength of this Penn State team is, is, is their defensive line, Chop Robinson, uh, you got in the linebacker side, you got Curtis Jacobs, it, it, so much talent, NFL talent on that side of the ball. And you're right. I, and I think it goes back to the same thing I just said about about uh, about Drew Aller. Cade McNamara is going to have to throw the football, too. You know, they're, they're going yeah. to they're gonna have to run the ball. But that's what Penn State – that's what Penn State's going to do. They're going to load the box. They're going to let their front seven play good football. You know what Iowa's going to try to do running the ball. And it's going to open up open up opportunities for Cade McNamara. And, and – I think, yeah, you're right. You got to be able to run the football. I don't think that Iowa will come out and run for 200 yards. I think they're gonna they're gonna run the ball and try to try to stay efficient on offense. But McNamara is gonna have to take some shots down the field. You know, he has yeah. he has three picks on the season. The one thing that cannot happen in the whiteout, it, what cannot happen is K. McNamara can't turn the football over. Yeah, and, and I know that I know that's easy football talk. Like, oh, you can't turn the ball over. No, in the whiteout game, you cannot turn the football over. You'll lose mm-hmm. the game. Um, and, and that's also something like I want to see early in this game, Iowa try to take some kind of early shot down the field. It has to be, you have to be smart because I just said you can't turn it over. But the best way, if you look at historically when teams win the whiteout game, they take the crowd out of it early in the game. Yeah. Right? And Penn State always comes back and it's always a good game. But if, if Iowa first drive, Penn State comes down and cover one and they get a press corner and it's like, OK, like let, let, let's let's air it out and let's see if we can take a 40 yard shot down the field and take the crowd out of it right away, because that, that'll take them out uh, or at least take them out by 15, 20 percent lower than the decimal level already is in Beaver Stadium. I think that's a huge thing. But again, it's the balance of taking that shot, getting the crowd out of it. But McNamara can't turn the ball over. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great point. I would even add this too. Whether it's turnovers, there's one more thing too: is three and outs. You have to avoid three and outs because I just think of this crowd; they are dying for a play to be made so they can just go nuts. They just need a reason to explode and go nuts. And if you, I, I, the analogy I was thinking about here is, you're trying to run. You think about running uh, uh, around the track. When the crowd is involved in going nuts like they're capable of doing, it's kind of like you're running into the wind. Like you're running heavily into wind. It is exhausting. It's hard. You feel the resistance. And if you're turning the ball over, that wind picks up. If you're going three and out, that wind picks up. It makes it that much more challenging. So I agree with you. I think to your point about the three and outs is that comes to me back to staying out of third and long, which goes back to your point about you got to be able to run the football. Uh, yeah. More, and two, more turnovers in football happen 
on third and long than any other down and distance, right? That that That's where they happen. In this kind of game for Iowa and Penn State, I think you got to reserve the right to punt. Stay out of third down and long. Try to give yourself third down and manageable. And you can't turn the ball over if you are in third down and long. Reserve the right to punt. Flip the field. Uh, and I was allow your defense for Iowa to, to, to play against a young quarterback and take your chances that way. So you know, there's a lot to watch for in this game. It's going to be going to be a fun one. Iowa's phenomenal on special teams, and they love their punters out there. So hey, I know it's not bore or it's a little boring and se- not sexy, but hey, listen, reserve the right to punt. I love it. How about another big time matchup? Ohio State going on the road to South Bend playing Notre Dame. I, I just look at this and I think of I look at this as week one, week two, week three, the pillars of conversations. Week one, it was like. Wait a second. Yeah, you know, they won. They won on the road against a Big Ten opponent who we now know, Indiana. That's that's a tough football team. And there's like, wait a second. This isn't. This doesn't look like we thought it was supposed to. It didn't look like last year. Then week two, it's like, okay, you play Youngstown State. You blow them out. And but it was a step in the right direction, but maybe not enough of a step. And then you go into Western Kentucky, and it's your last chance before playing Notre Dame. And they smoke them. And it's like, okay, well, okay. That's what we need to see. You think about the progression of the perspective in the outside, um, you know, perspective of the team. What's your opinion of Ohio State going into this game? I think that I think that I've I've heard all the outside noise right about Ohio State and Kyle McCord. I had concerns about Kyle McCord in the beginning because of you know just how long it took him to win the job. And all that, all, you know, the the controversy around who the starter was going to be, I, I didn't think played well and favorable into his situation. With that said, he's done a good job of just, from what it seems, blocking out the noise and being himself every week. And then week three played his best football, right? He looked composed. He showed control over the offense. He played free, like wasn't afraid to make mistakes. I know it was against Western Kentucky. But I think what we know now is Kyle McCord doesn't need to go win every game with his arm. He doesn't need to do too much. You have guys like Marvin Harrison Jr., Abuka, Cade Stover, Julian Fleming, Henderson. I mean, you have so many guys that can make plays on offense for you. You don't need to be a superhero. Uh, and and I think the key against Notre Dame now, with massive matchup for both teams, huge for Notre Dame. I mean, this could be the biggest game Notre Dame's played in the last 25 years. I mean, like yeah. it, it is a massive game for Notre Dame, huge for Ohio State as well. But you know Notre Dame's going to come in with every trick up their sleeve. Can you sustain drives against Notre Dame's defense? So don't turn the football over. Be efficient on offense. Uh, and don't try to do too much. Get your guys the ball in space and let them play. I don't think McCord needs to go out and, and, and you know, be an absolute wizard in this game. I think about even last year when you had C.J. Stroud and, and, of course, early in the game against Notre Dame, Jackson Smith and Jigba went down. It was like, wait. And I think about how they won that game. Well, they won the game, actually, particularly in the second half and into the fourth quarter, running the ball with Mayan Williams. He was he, It was downhill physical. They were getting into 12 personnel. They had fullbacks in there. And it was they, they were – and that's, that's what makes Ohio State special is they're – as much as we know that explosive passing attack, they can run the ball and get nasty. And, and last week was their best week for, from an offensive line standpoint. You know, w- one thing I'm interested here, Adam, and I wanted to get your opinion on this, is on the defensive side of the football. Sam Hartman is playing some damn good ball to start the season. Very clean, very clean, making few mistakes. And I think about Jim Knowles' defensive structure, which is they are aggressive. Sometimes that means they are vulnerable. And in a perfect world, if you're Ohio State, you would like to be able to rush for and generate pressure. But I, I just haven't quite seen that yet on, on the season, whether it's JT Tuimoloa or Jack Sawyer. Joe Alt, the left tackle for Notre Dame, I know you like Olu Fashionu. It's been good between those two dudes that are tackle one in the draft next year. Joe Alt is, is playing a clean season. So I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm just trying to play this game in my head. And I'm saying, okay, I don't really know that the defensive ends from Ohio State are going to be able to get organic pressure on Sam Hartman. So that means Jim Knowles is going to have to bring pressure, which means Sam Hartman is going to have to be disciplined, which means the secondary from Ohio State is going to have to be disciplined. What's the benchmark for this Ohio State defense? You know, How do they find success in this game? You make a good point, Jake, about – uh, about the lack of ability to get home with four, and you got to get pressure on San Hartman. I mean, he's been so efficient this year throwing the football, 70-plus percent completion rate, hasn't thrown an interception. Uh, 
So you got to bring pressure. I, I think the, the one thing that, that Jim Knowles has done in his past is what they call simulated pressure, where uh, you may st- you may bring four, but bring it from dif- different areas of the field, drop a defensive end, bring a linebacker, and still allow your guys to play uh, to play in coverage. So you can still drop seven into coverage uh, and just try to get home with some confusing things. And, and a lot of times, too, I think for Sam Hartman and what Jim Knowles likes to do with being ag- aggressive, it's not always about actually bring pressure it's about the illusion of pressure pre-snap and and, uh Mm -hmm. i saw i saw it last week when i called the rutgers game they they do a great job of it it's it's causing the confusion forcing the the offensive lineman to to communicate and forcing the quarterback to think about oh boy is he coming or not like if he comes i'm hot right here and it maybe makes him take a second uh you know that that distracts him from you know maybe a one-on-one matchup or something like that so i think ohio state's got to cause havoc create the illusion of pressure and get Sam Hartman off balance. But you don't want to allow Sam Hartman to to play one-on-one matchups all day with your secondary and force your secondary to be on islands against Notre Dame. Uh, so it, it's going to be a good test. I think, I think Hartman's shown that he's the kind of quarterback that can win these kinds of games by most importantly being efficient, not turning the ball over. Notre Dame is rarely in third down and longs. They're rarely behind the sticks, and that's what allows him to play uh, with, with such efficiency as a quarterback. So... Ohio State's got a, got a big challenge in containing this offense. You know I'm a big metaphor guy and an analogy guy, and I love what you said. There's the pressure, and then there's the illusion of pressure. Halloween's around the corner. You go to a haunted house. Behind every corner isn't a ghost, but there's the potential for a ghost. And that anticipation is what builds the, builds the, uh, the, the nervousness and the, I guess, excitement, if you want to call that, if you're into that kind of thing. So, all right, as we round out the Big Ten here, you called Rutgers last week. I called Michigan last week. This Rutgers team is 3-0. Greg Schiano is a damn good football coach. I, I, I just don't think he gets enough credit for what he does consistently at Rutgers. It's, it's playing in the Big Ten East is no easy task. But they're 3-0. They're rolling. Kyle Manungai leads the, leads the conference in rushing. Dude runs really hard. What are some of the things you're looking for in this matchup this weekend? Man, it, it's a good matchup. I, I, I want to see, like, we don't really know how good Rutgers is, right? Like, we're, they, they could be really good, <laughs> or they could be a team that's 3-0 that, that, that isn't as talented as maybe it looks like on paper after three weeks. Like, how good is Virginia Tech, who Rutgers just beat? Uh, so there, there, there's some question marks that are going to get answered against the, uh, with, with this test. There's no doubt that there is so much excitement around this Rutgers program. You, can, I was, you could feel it when I was there on Saturday. I mean, the place was rocking. People are loving it. I mean, 3-0. and like it, But but there's been times before Rutgers has started 3-0 and has not ended the season well. So mm-hmm. uh, the, all eyes are going to be on Gavin Wimsett, their quarterback. Jake, you and I have talked about it as you're preparing for, for this week and as I had on last week. All the arm talent you could want can make every throw from all the different arm slots. There's a play that he made week one, I believe, against Northwestern. He's rolling oh, to yeah. the left off one foot, throws it across his body on a, on a missile 20 yards on the field. I mean, he can make every throw. But he yeah. hasn't been forced to win with his arm yet. They've been able to run the football. So I'm excited to see it because he's going to have to throw the ball against, against Michigan. I'm excited to see what they can do on offense. And, and Kirk Soraka, their offensive coordinator, he has a very clear style of what, what he wants to do. He wants to run the football. And he wants to take shots down the field um, early in early in a drive or, or uh, on an early down a distance and and uh, try to take advantage of you lacking on defense. But they're going to run the ball. And, and then Kyle Manunga, who you, who you mentioned, Jake, that guy gets better as the game goes on. I, I mean, literally, I'm watching this game, and, like, he's better in the fourth quarter than he was in the first quarter. Uh, he just wears them down. So there's a lot of a lot of things to be excited about on, uh, with this Rutgers team. Uh, and and uh, maybe the biggest one is their defense. I mean, there's – I said in the open on the broadcast, there's there's a few guarantees in life, one of which is that Greg Shana will have a great defense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you always know how they're going to play. Uh, so it's going to be a good test for Michigan. I'm excited to see – uh, J.J. McCarthy have a big challenge uh, against this this Rutgers defense. Yeah, so J.J., is, it's a bounce-back week. Um, felt last week he had had so much success throughout the early part of the season, and then, fi- then the run game stepping up, and his opportunities to throw the ball were decreased, and sometimes what happens is, is you try to play a little bit of hero ball, and that, that usually, again, like we were talking about an hour at the beginning of the show, you have to stay disciplined. Not every game has to be a high-level type performance. Sometimes you just gotta you just gotta 
do your job, right? And that's the challenge. But when I think about that's a, this is the fork in the road for Rutgers. I know Manun guy is going to run the ball. I know Wimsett's going to be involved in the run, running game as well. Those two guys are going to run the ball. But this is the best test that they have because that Michigan front seven, and really you can call them front 14 because they're too deep at every single position. It is easier said than done running into them. So I think back to their game last year, Rutgers-Michigan. It was very close going into half. But in the second half, in the third quarter, Wimsett had to throw the ball. And when he had to throw the ball, it led to two pick sixes, which opened the game wide open. He, he, as, he as you mentioned, arm talent. What does that mean? It doesn't mean you're going to have efficiency, accuracy, completion percentage. It just means you have the capability to make every throw. And the dude, you can't. You can't deny that he can make every throw on the field. But the decision-making, the accuracy, the consistency is the part that comes into play and what will be the key to Rutgers this week if they want to stick into this game into the second half and, and be knocking on the door towards, towards a potential upset. So a um, bunch of good games. We could probably talk for an hour and a half about the whole slate of Big Ten. It's, we could talk for an hour and a half every single week about football because you're a football guy. I'm a football guy. Our viewers football guys and girls and everything in between. We, we, we just love to have you part of our show. With that in mind, we'll see you next week. This has been the Button Brenneman Show. Thanks for tuning in.